Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns. I'm executive director here at All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Today we'll be talking about access needs at work. Um, but first, by way of introduction, Brain Club, of course, is our um, education program. It's our very intentionally created education space for the collective All Brains Belong community uh, with the purpose of providing education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Just a reminder, this is not for medical or mental health advice. This is also not a support group. This is a education space. It's also um, not a place to debate philosophy or view of the world. I'll tell you more about our view of the world. Our goal here at Burn Club is to create a space where people can feel safe and experience something different from the outside world, um, where people can come together to collectively learn and unlearn. And how do we do that? We do that with an intentional view of the world, and that being that uh, we all have different brains and bodies. There's not one correct type of brain or body, um, and that safety comes first. And for us, what that means is that we affirm all aspects of identity, neurotypes, gender, sexuality, race, disability, ethnicity, and all other forms of diversity. And though we presume good intentions, we can't allow language that has the effect of excluding or harming other participants. So if you feel unsafe, if you feel excluded for any reason, please send a direct message. Um, uh, uh, let us know, because we really take that very seriously. Um, and uh, because the collective, collective access needs, access needs of the group take priority over that of the individual. And speaking of access needs, um, all forms of participation are okay here. You can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly do not need you to like look at the camera or sit still or anything. Um, so feel free to walk, move, fidget, stim, take breaks, um, whatever needs doing. Um, and uh, observation is also a completely valid form of participation, um, but we also do want to create space for everyone to be able to share their ideas, whether that be in the chat or with mouth words, whatever form of communication um, is comfortable. Um, uh, uh, given that we all have different brains, we all have different processing speeds, um, so chat. The chat box is often kind of running in parallel to what's happening on the screen. I may read out selections, um, but um, please don't uh, don't feel like you're necessarily like missing the main event if it's hard to see like how fast the chat moves sometimes. I, I miss most of the chat because I can't keep up with it moving so fast. So just um, participate in like whatever parallel track works works for you. Okay. Um, and last thing I just want to uh, notice, I just note is that, um, you know, we really try to have our culture here at Brain Club be very intentional. And so we very intentionally facilitate it. Um, and, you know, we might need to interrupt or redirect if, um, you know, there's anything that feels unsafe. Okay. Um, I seem to have lost my visual support to show you how to turn on closed captions. Um, let me see if I can find that. I don't know where it went. Oh, it just went out of order. That's all. Closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might have the live transcript closed captioning icon. But if you don't see that, try the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles or the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to actually open up the chat box so that I can see it if anybody's using it. All right. Um, so we are wrapping up our October theme about understanding your access needs. Um, just a reminder, there is no Brain Club next week. Um, so this will be the last Brain Club for October. Um, we've been talking about access needs in various settings all throughout the month. Um, in fact, we're always talking about access needs, even when it's not necessarily the theme of the month. So today we'll be talking about access needs at work. Next month, our theme will be health and belonging. 
Um, we will be um, joined next week, uh, not next week, uh, next Spring Club. So in two weeks from today, we'll be joined um, by um, a, a set of community panelists representing four different community organizations, all talking about their vision for inclusion. Um, and uh, we'll continue to explore that theme of health and belonging uh, throughout the month, which is very fitting because next month kicks off our Did You Know This Could Be Healthcare campaign? Uh, where thanks to a generous matching donation from an ABB supporter, as soon as we hit 25000 it becomes 50000 which is exactly um, what supports an entire year's worth of community programs, um, free community programs like Brain Club. Um, so uh, we're excited for November. Okay, so as you may know, if you've uh, becoming a Brain Club for a while. All Brains Belong has programs in all of these different buckets. And so Brain Club lives in this education space, but we have all these different buckets that we are trying to improve the lives of people with all types of brains through. And employment is um, an area that our community advisory board asked us to work on because so many people do not have their access needs met at work. And so in addition to helping um, patients in our employment support program learn about their employment related access needs, we're also on the other side, also working with employers to help them better understand how to create workplace environments where people with all types of brains can thrive. So really trying to bridge the double empathy program by supporting employment at, you know, on both sides. Um, and why? Um, because uh, the status quo is unacceptable. So autistic adults have four to eight times higher rates of unemployment. 75% of ADHDers have employment related challenges. And what we know is that unemployment increases the probability of developing a chronic health condition by 83%. That's why to us, employment is part of health. And when we think about the social model of disability where it's not a set of deficits of the person. It's about the inaccessibility of the world. How much disability someone experiences um, is relative. So not to erase um, the struggle, but just to name that the struggle is worse when the world is more, access more inaccessible. And so when we think about access needs, access needs being anything that's required to meaningfully or fully participate in one's environment or community, everybody has access needs. It's just that neurodivergent people less likely to have our access needs met by the defaults of society, including in the workplace. And when we think about some of the different types of access need considerations at work, I mean, it's so many different things from the environment to communication or executive functioning to technology to movement to how we get instructions to how we're supervised and managed to how we receive feedback to how much or how little structure we have or how much or how little autonomy we have. It's just a lot of different things that are needs. They're not optional, they are access needs. And so it's really about um, how do we better understand our own access needs as individuals and how can we self-advocate for what we need? Because the goal would be what Dr. Thomas Armstrong would refer to as niche construction. The idea of you learn about your brain and you design a life that works for your brain. And uh, we don't have that a lot of the time. In fact, we have this more of the time. This is this image shows the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. We don't want that. Um, one, I, uh, many of you have heard me quote one of our community members um, before, but um, I don't know what my access needs are. I just know they're not being met. Yup, it's about right. So it's really, how do we begin to take on this lens of access to understand that when something's not going well, it may be because it's an unmet access need. So it begins for many people with starting like, what's not working? You may not be able to say like, my access need is X, but you can probably figure out un unmet access needs by working backwards. So asking yourself, like, when do you feel terrible and this may in fact relate to an unmet access need. And then 
um, you might move forward to say, well, what's working? This might indicate that your access needs are being met. And step three, what could be working better? And are there changes I can make on my own without even needing to involve other people? Um, and uh, then if, if if that's not met, of course, there's you know, legally protected um, protections, right? Um, but are there changes you can make even short of that? Changes you can make on your own without needing to involve others. So anyway, I'm gonna stop right here. Oops, there we go. Um, so uh, with that, um, David's gonna play a video um, a recording, a pre-recorded panel um, from conversations with several of our community members from a few months ago, talking about the connection of um, their access needs at work and how that connects to health. Go for it, David. And the chat box will go in. This video, this video will run about 35 minutes. What have you seen in your workplace or in workplaces that you've worked in um, about how working conditions impact health? I work food service jobs. I'm a baker. So I've, all of my jobs have been in kitchens. The things that I've found that impact health conditions the most are the practices in food service around um, scheduling. I don't know if you've ever heard the phrase in school, um, the bell doesn't release you, I release you. <laughs> in, in, you know, early education, before the pandemic hit, people were struggling. Um, it was a field that was already really kind of um, hemorrhaging people. It was really suffering. Here we were open 10 and a half hours every day for children. And so teachers were required to be here on either end of that too. So like for an administrator, I, I would be here for at least 12 hours a day. Um, but so we had we kind of walked into that scenario and then worked to even just maintain it, you know, just to keep it, go keep the machine going. Mentality where it's like, I know it said nine on your sheet, but you're here until it's done. Mm -hmm. uh, and because food service tends to pay less than a lot of fields, um, it can be very, very dangerous to try and set boundaries in situations like that so because we need it i mean these are human lives that we're taking care of so we need to be here we need people covering um we need the proper legal ratios of adult to child so we could we were less flexible with people's schedules longer hours we had more kids we really kind of when we came in we filled the rooms because that's like the business model of course like more kids equals more money coming in so we had more kids in rooms larger group sizes and fewer teachers yeah, I mean, it It ended up being sort of, we're just doing everything we can to survive. What have you seen in your workplace about how working conditions impact health? I mean, I think it, in terms, it impacts health in terms of stressors. And I think there's like, in, in a lot of ways, there's a ton of them. There's like social stressors, conflict, conflict with coworkers and supervisors. There's performance stressors, understanding tasks and executing them. There's productivity stress. Um, can I meet the output and production expectations in the time that's allotted with the with the energy that I can sustainably access? Um, there's logistical stressors. I'm working um, during preset hours with a schedule that's often set by somebody else at varying locations for varying durations, varying activities, varying obligations. So if I'm a person that has effect, uh, emotional or um, executive functioning or motor pattern, motor patterning or attention or energy challenges or un unpredictable sleep patterns, all of that can make uh, keeping track of schedules, uh, uh, having the energy to follow schedules, uh, being able to get to the right place at the right time with the right supplies um, and, and um, and perform consistently during the hours of obligation. Um, really difficult if my body clock and my energy vary widely, um, along with my ability to plan um, and anticipate needs and concentrate and pay attention. I have a brain that means that I really, really need to know what's going to happen before I go and do something and it becomes extremely dysregulating for me and for a lot of other people who I've worked with when we can't 
have like even a ballpark of like how many hours we're going to be working, what that shift is going to look like, how many people are going to be there, whether everyone else is going to show up, because those are all common concerns in the field that I work in. And the uncertainty of that makes me dysregulated to an extent that it's like, okay, I said I could do these things and I could be responsible for these tasks, but you know, I am not fully present anymore. So it's a lot <laughs> less physically safe for me to be, you know, lifting the 50 pound bags of flour or operating the heavy machine, or trying to cut this thing super fast because my understanding of my body has gone from like 30% to 0% because it doesn't feel like I can, it doesn't feel my needs don't feel relevant to my safety and my environment anymore. So I am not going to think about whether I'm too warm. I'm not going to think about whether I'm thirsty. I'm not going to think about whether I need to sit down for five minutes and eat something. I'm just going to do it until it's done and I can be done being here. Like supervisory stress. And so how to be a person in an who highly values autonomy, like like a lot of us are, you know, the, the PDA stuff, persistent desire for autonomy. So how do I how do, do I be in a workplace um, and a person who consistently values autonomy and needs to understand why someone else's way is better in order to really get myself to do it in an environment where basically unquestioning or minimally questioning compliance is expected. So um, something that I really struggle with is like there's social cues and then there's the social cues of capitalism and those are like you can't find out like once you find out like the motivation behind what someone is telling you it's like you have to do the like what is the hardest thing in the world to me and just accept that the answer is just because <laughs> um like i need to know why something is happening why something does something and it's very very hard for me to be like it just is that way and you need to not think about it for a while um and part of that motivation that like drives all business is like not wanting people to know that they have to ask certain questions or have to advocate for themselves in certain ways and certain jobs making it much much more risky to have like try and enter into those negotiations so i've been in situations where i'm being like dramatically underpaid <laughs> um because i did not know that everyone else around me was getting like the salaries that they were getting from a place of like i've been doing this that and the other that is beyond the job description i signed on for it is time for you to pay me more money because i am doing more labor for you there's been times in that where like you know it's my turn to talk or relate something or engage in the conversation and um i I want to make a point. I have a point to make. Um, and then I start getting the sense from the facilitator that like, you know, uh, that person, he or she will cut me off or kind of like, you know, I get the sense moving along and which um, I think because I also suffer from some low self-esteem i think which is an outcome of you know my oh, adhd so then i'm suddenly like in this loop where i'm like well you know maybe what i have to say is not of interest you know and it's really just i think that i in that kind of environment um you know there's a lot of pressure on getting to the point and 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 letting the rest of the group engage and i certainly want to to um fit into that trying trying to i guess you know, sort of navigate within that framework that is the framework that is mostly dictated by neurotypical people, right? Right. And so there's there's also this element of, um, you know, the, the, the a neuro inclusive space would would involve a facilitator that like lays out ground rules about there's no right way to participate. There's no right way to communicate and like explicitly naming that, you know, that's not what most groups do. What kitchens have. Um, but also like, I'm transgender and part of that was that I recently had, I like I experience or experienced chest dysphoria. And so for a long time, 
I was binding my chest. And that meant that like, not only is it super dysregulating to work in more than eight hour a day, but uh, doing that <laughs> results in like stabbing rib pains that may or may yeah. not be you after surgery. So part of it was like, I had to have surgery. And that was a medical necessity for me, like regardless of how it impacted my mental health. Um, and like accessing other forms of gender affirming health care were really, really imperative to me. And I, that's not going to be the case for every trans person. But like, I think that's definitely like a consideration as kitchens tend to attract multiply marginalized people. Because I've been in a lot of kitchens with other trans folks, with other neurodivergent folks, where it's like, okay, so these expectations are built around cis bodies and a one neurotype. <laughs> um and my body actually can't <laughs> be here yeah. for 12 hours <laughs> um otherwise i start having heart palpitations yeah. so and then and then you add on top of that the personal life stressors um that that um can come up and any of those things uh, one can have difficulty i can have difficulty managing become dysregulated um, the hyper focus means that i tend to get and stay distracted from work those are all stressors and then once i get like any of those stressors you know that that can start to lead that that it goes unresolved can lead to it really gets me into a, a, a vicious cycle of a, a dysregulation spiral so i get i get stressed out i get anxious um that which leads to mental and physical tension i go into defensive behaviors worry self-protective avoidance distraction um there's this regulation including sleep which leads to less capacity for attention less capacity for motor skills and motor planning less executive functioning which then can lead to more and bigger mistakes um hyper focus getting stuck on the wrong details self-justification externalizing blame attacking the perceived sources of threat all of which go over really well in a work environment leading to more fit more negative feedback possible discipline job loss bad reviews that limit my potential to advance and my potential for access to organizational power and privilege that could actually help me fix the problems that are affecting me. And then all of that leads to more dysregulation, less resilience, greater vulnerability to that. Um, the tendency to hyper-focus, which is consistent for a lot of us with ADHD and, and, and autism, and it's a superpower when it comes to focusing on job related tasks, but it's a liability if there's a stressor um, because, and that's that's troubling because then it becomes difficult to th think about anything or do anything else until that stressor is resolved. And so un unless there is an ability to resolve um, uh, to resolve issues of concern. The hyper focus tends to um, tends to really get in the way of the the things that um, that employers are looking for. So when my needs aren't met, but me asking to have my needs met is going to be penalized. Remember when I was working uh, at a child care center, my position was as a floater which meant that I didn't know what was needed of me or expected of me or what my day was going to look like until I was there. And I remember having a big conversation with my boss and being like, okay, this next year around, I can't handle this. And I feel that my, my uh, showing up here, my attendance and being a good employee is being impacted when I don't know what's expected of me. We had this big long talk and then um, she like reformatted it that floaters would be assigned to specific rooms so you would have at least know where you were going to be who you were going to be working with and everything and i was like oh my gosh that's so amazing and then i remember having oh and it like oh man it puts a little ache in in my chest i remember feeling so like proud of that and everything and then walking by and hearing someone be like you mean i have to do the same thing every day and I was like, oh my gosh, I just ruined that person's life. Like now that person is gonna have to do the same thing every day and it's all my fault. Um, Cause you know, I have a control over all of their feelings. Um. <laughs> so, so a couple of things that are standing out for me listening to this part of your story 
Um, one is it's a story of unmet access needs, access needs being anything that someone needs for full, meaningful participation. So you needed novelty, you needed multiple different things in the day, you need multiple locations, you needed movement, um, mm. you know, you need a variety, like all of this. And so that was unmet. Another thing I heard from your story was it's a story of interdependence. Like I think independence is so overly glorified. Autonomy is really important, but 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 the idea that like you don't need other people, interdependence, being connected to, relying on other people, like like how profoundly human is that? And so mm. anyway, that's I'm, I'm also that I'm, I'm also hearing that from your story, and that you know in the team that you're leading now that you are bringing this lens of of whether you're using this term or not, you're thinking about access needs and how to help the people that you're leading have met access needs and like you know um i think there's a lot of small businesses that struggle with like hiring good people and keeping people and like all the all the lost revenue of turnover and all the things or when you train a new person um like when people have their access needs they are less likely to quit their jobs for sure yeah right exactly um yeah it's just not a one size fits all not just because it was in childcare, typically at that time, I think like a revolving door staffing wise. I mean, people were really burning out. It was a recipe for burnout, stress, fatigue. Um, we couldn't actually do our jobs. I mean, yeah, I mean, it it ended up being sort of we're just doing everything we can to survive. What strategies have you found helpful to cope with unhealthy work environments? <laughs> When I, when I started to write these down, it was sort of an off the cuff. I started to kind of laugh, but and I sort of thought, well, I just am being like, you know, kind of off the cuff and sarcastic. But I actually think these are are actually these are actually the strategies I use, um, which kind of says something like saving enough money to quit or take extended leaves of absence, um, getting healthcare professionals in my court so I can qualify for continued health insurance under the family medical leave absence or temporary perm permanent disability when I do leave, um, structuring my life simply enough that if I need to quit, I can get government benefits, structuring my income so I can earn just enough to afford rent and still qualify for food stamps, heating oil, and Medicaid, uh, researching ways to house myself if I end up homeless, self-employment um, to, to, um, to get myself maximum freedom and independence, I think there's there's a lot of people who are in work situations that are not working for their brains. How did you come to start your business? I worked in a corporate traditional architecture practice setting for almost 20 years. I, I um, started working. I went to architecture school, night school for architecture. So successful, but my own measure I felt like I wasn't actually doing anything. And I had a really tough time sitting at a desk. <laughs> um, and so, um, you know, so I, I, I looked for opportunities to basically get out of the office when I bought a house and I'd started to, um, do work on it. So I go into the office in the morning and then uh, say, I, well, I got to go, you know, I, I can only put it in a half day today and I'd leave and I had all my equipment set up and I'd climb out the bedroom window and put shingles up on the side of the house. And that was like super, um, uh, I, I, it was just so fulfilling to me. Uh, I basically started the construction business. Um, and the reason for that was, People would drive by the house when I was working on it and they'd stop and they'd be like, I need somebody to ring shingle my house. And and so that's how I got into doing construction. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I'm completely self-taught when it comes to like, you know, estimating and that whole side of um, I'm, I'm trained as as an architect. So the design part of it is um, is uh, very manageable. But um, uh and and the practice has been through some ups and downs I changing careers i mean literally as my i, I like it's in my 30s my mental capacity to really do the grind of law 
started to, to massively decrease and I just couldn't cognitively sustain 60 or 80 hour weeks were of being mentally on. And so I, I switched to sort of a mental health and then um, eventually more peer support, which which drew a lot more on experiential and empathic capacities. And I didn't have to be, I didn't have to use my problem solving abilities like, you know, 16 hours a day. And that was much, and that, and that's been a much better path for me. There's a, there's a, a lot of pressure in a kind of business, you know, environment, small business, whatever, um, to, move things along, get to the point, you know, set the table and let your, my team delegate. So, so that's where it, it, sometimes it gets in the way of not that I'm, I don't think that I'm, I'm have learned to be pretty good about delegating, but uh, sometimes it just takes me a long time to get there. So uh, I made the decision to myself that I needed a business partner that could sort of ground the business in the things that I didn't have uh, or that I, I couldn't bring to the table. Kind of worked through to figure out like what I need to prioritize in a job in the hiring process is I, if I can, uh, if I can avoid it, I won't take jobs where I can't wear headphones. Um, and because for me, music is my like number one self-regulation technique. Um, and it helps to block out the sound of air vents and convection ovens, which is super overwhelming to me. Um, so one of the questions that I always ask on like an interview or a training day is like, okay, how many other people are going to be in the kitchen with me? Um, will I need to be super alert to people like passing through the kitchen? Can I bring headphones or earbuds in with me? I wouldn't be doing it if I didn't love it. Um, a lot of people get siloed into food service as like a tool of marginalization of like, we're going to shove you back here and underpay you where no one can see you um, for 20 years. But, um, you know, it's it's cool that I get to like go to work every day. And I know that what I'm, what I'm doing, like what I do yeah. is feed people. I make food for people to eat that makes them full or makes them happy um, or makes them frustrated and gives them something to complain about to the other people that they got breakfast with. Um, but like, I know that the job that I'm doing is necessary <laughs> for like human beings and that it often adds extra joy to people's lives and I know that when I leave the building my work is done I'm not worried about like I missed something I'm not worried about like is this take-home work going to take me like the amount of time that I thought it would I like my time once I leave the building is mine um what do you wish other employers knew about creating healthy workplace culture Exactly. And so the pandemic actually was helpful in the sense for us that we reevaluated like, wait, is this working for us? And we're able to reflect on some observations again and say, actually, that's not working for us and really be like, wait a sec, what are we doing and why? And then can that change based on what we want to be doing? Um, and one of the things we wanted to be doing was less of a revolving door, more retention. Um, in our staff, because we know that consistency of care will also provide a better foundation for the children if it's this, these same teachers um, and those same colleagues working together. And we know people want to be here. And so the question is, what do you need to be here? Like, what what is it that you need in order to be doing this job that you love or that you want to be doing? So before we connected with Mel and All Brains Belong, before even knowing about the term access needs, we were sort of asking folks what their access needs were to be able to show up and feel good about the work that they were doing. Because people were kind of showing up, but it wasn't feeling good, you know. Um, and so to feel good in your work um, and to show up was really important. And it just was a lot of a lot of conversation, individual conversations, conversations as a whole, as a whole staff to determine sort of what we needed. Um, and really making space for those voices to be heard. 
this. So it wasn't that Vicky and I were saying, this is what people need, you know, as sort of part of the leadership team. It was really asking those people to tell us because we can make tons of assumptions, but um, a lot of those tend to be inaccurate. And so that was a really, I just want to emphasize yeah. how important that piece was um, for, for us in the process. Well, and we learned that particular to the pandemic, we learned that a lot of people didn't have a primary care doctor or didn't have health insurance, including some of the admin team. And so we um, became, in a sense, especially Cecilia, like resource coordinators, and we would have on the clock, you know, during the work week, we have we still do this, mm -hmm. we have time with people who need because you're working Monday through Friday, but that's when everything's open and you have to make your phone calls. And um, so we, we we have time for people to connect with one of us, mm -hmm. usually Cecilia, to like call Vermont Health Connect and figure out health insurance, or to call the health advocates, or mm -hmm. to call and how the emergency housing, find a therapist, a therapist. Um, mm -hmm. food, access to food, yeah. So those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. We just had to learn more about people's individual struggles and individual situations, and also then the collective needs of like what are the barriers to doing the work that we want to do. And we really want to go against the rhetoric that like everything should be done in isolation by yourself. And so that's also a way that we opened that up to say, let's do this together because, you know, health insurance, for example, doesn't make sense to a lot of us. So if we can work together and support each other, that feels better for everyone. Um, so I use this uh, like a to do list app kind of thing, like just they're not task reminders, they're reminders to me either my brain or my business owner and, and one of the things is you know this pops up every morning at uh when i'm starting work it uh is good leaders offer opportunity for growth but as importantly they also understand unique needs of the people they are leading so you know for me that's like um that's what i had to when i recognized that it was because I recognized like that was my own situation, you know, so it makes sense that like if I can't expect myself to be kind of, you know, neurotypical, then there's a likelihood that all my staff is not, like nobody's neurotypical, right? You know, so um, there is no such thing as that. Absolutely agree. It's just the the like the the assumptions or the cultural beliefs that people grow up with like you're a little kid and you're basically taught there is one correct default way to be a person and it's nonsense you have a lot of trade partners subcontractors uh, material suppliers and stuff like that and it, it is so we are so dependent you know um and um and we we try to have um we try to have a framework of expectation for certain things because you know it can't be just a total free for all but at the same time like there's like our 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 plaster that does almost all the board and plaster on our jobs um he's a single dad he uh he manages uh you know the all the the business financial end of his business um he's got a couple of staff um he also stocks like the job sites every his job sites every morning you know so um so we know i know just over the years that uh we're not likely to get a quote but we've talked and we know enough um uh that we know what his pricing is so you know we make we we make some uh, uh, accommodations there, and then you know he's gonna send me a message on usually you know maybe Thursday. Um, uh, can I, can I get a check? You know, and uh, that's really hmm. tricky. And what I'm hearing from you is this awareness of like the whole of a person. You know, so you mentioned, you know, this person's a single dad and they're doing this and they're doing that and they're doing you're even thinking about them as the character in their own movie of their own business, which I mean that's the way that my brain told you took your story and translated it. And I'm picturing the, you know, the guy and he's doing all the things and he's delivering this anyway, and he's got the kids. Anyway, like you're seeing that and think about it. so many people are not giving a character like that the right time of day. Mm. Yeah, for sure um i i think um and the the challenge 
it hasn't been easy to stay in business because um because um because it takes time that's not necessarily um and and that that kind of investment um is not what our system is set up to reward by uh, you know um making uh making enough money to keep the doors open um but right especially when you've got you know so so you as you've described you need a team an interdependent team to run the business and then when you're responsible for the livelihoods of other people i mean it's a, i feel it too it's just a lot of mm, pressure it is a lot of pressure yeah yeah uh because because you do feel responsible for uh your your team and your trade partners and your vendors and their families and uh their communities and you know it's um uh yeah uh you that 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 interdependence is um it's all about community what do you wish other employers knew about creating a healthy workplace culture um that it's not enough to fix problems as they come up you have to think about the people who are working for you the people who might work for you the things you might not know about the people who are working for you and whether or not there is already space for them to work comfortably and healthily in that environment um and i think that like that is something that's like really under considered and that like a lot of the time that leaves room for people to um create ableist and classist practices um and couch them in language of non-discrimination um and that if you really think about like okay could this kind of person who experiences these kinds of marginalization walk in here and feel like they could commit to this job um like would they be able to do it would they be able to account for their safety and their health would they feel comfortable knowing that they would not be fired for being trans or for being a person of color and have it like couched in some other terminology like what can i do to make sure that this place is not only safe but like has space built in for people who are not like the normative cishet white man model that we built the 40 hour work week around um and that like if you aren't seeing a group or several groups of people represented in your workplace that is because you made it a space that they could not show up to you either like are advertising for employment in the wrong channels you are not offering enough money you are letting your employees say microaggressive ignorant stuff that they don't know about you are expecting your employees to be able to do things with their bodies um that they don't necessarily have to do i really think we need to reimagine work I mean, I just, I, 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 uh, I think it's bigger than just, um, I mean, I think, certainly think that there's ways that employers can be sensitive to a variety of stressors and sort of, you know, do this universal design thing, but it still doesn't get away from the power imbalance. So like having employers who are like, kind of like preemptively thinking about like, how are my employees how are my coworkers moving around this space and like having coworkers who were like okay i've got a little bit of positional power here how can i use this to make my coworkers lives better when i know it would be heard better coming from me and that's something that like having had people do that for me is like really important to me is like if i see a coworker at my job being treated unfairly or to like see something in like the kitchen get like that tends to like get them bent out of shape knowing that like as a man oftentimes people are more willing to listen to me than like my femme and woman counterparts being able to be like hey i've noticed that like we could really fix that problem eh? <laughs> like a lot of people work in areas that tend toward exploitation and dehumanization um and 
some of those folks are like, I'm just doing this until like, I make it in a creative field. I'm just doing this until I am finished with this certification that's going to let me do this job that I really care about. And some people are like, I've been forced to do this because of racism, because of classism and discrimination in hiring practices, so on and so forth. And some of us are there because we want to be and because we think that it's important that people do those jobs and that whether you are working a job that tends towards exploitation and dehumanization or you in your day-to-day -day life are profiting from other people working those jobs, whether it's buying your coffee at a coffee shop that a barista makes or like going to the grocery store where someone is stocking the shelves. Um, those are jobs that like are inherently like full of dignity, like that work matters on a fundamental level and is important and is noble and like even if you want to do it being treated poorly doing those kinds of jobs can really weigh on you and like it's important that you're doing that work whether you continue to do it or not it's you should be proud of it do you have any advice for other employers that might be wanting to be more aware of this kind of thing Prioritize humans that's and not profit. Yeah, that's exactly right. It's about respect for humans. I mean, to make it's not it's not easy, but it's kind of simple. Um, and you know, you, you can't have a healthy workplace environment where we're spending all of these waking hours if you're not thinking about those workers who are there um, and really recognizing that humans deserve to feel belonging and deserve to feel a place where they're part of something and in fact we thrive off of that sort of social collaboration and um i think for a long time a lot of us have been socialized like i was saying before to sort of silo isolate pull yourself up by your bootstraps um and that's something we really want to break down and try to rebuild in a different way where we're utilizing one another um as supports and this is all really important for us to be transparent about because we're teaching the children they're they're watching our every move um and it's important to us at turtle island that children are um going into the world you know with ideas about respect and kindness for humans and understanding that other human has a a, a place and has feelings and emotions you know and perspective um, and if we're asking kids to do that, then we better be doing it ourselves. So much wisdom there. So circling back, um, there's a um, a topic that came up in the chat about professionalism. And I think to me that um, that message of there's not one right way to be a person, there's not one right way to be an employee. And yet so many times um, the expectations of professionalism are based on the notion that there's one right way to be a person. Hi, Mel. I'd like to get some context to that because I was the one who posed that. Um, I have been facing some, I don't know if you would say like big D discrimination, but definitely at least little D discrimination on professionalism on, on my own actions and behaviors. Um, I have been called out by someone who is just become my own supervisor um, after um, one got swapped to a different um, department without me even knowing. I didn't even know that the um, supervisor uh, situation was changing unless until I actually asked if it was. So that was fun. But also this particular person who I've already inter in interacted with got so upset at me just trying to clarify such a situation. She was giving me really um, strong staring vibes that were giving me a lot of um, anxiety and stress and I needed to clarify her intent on those and she was so upset at me just clarifying that and said that was an unprofessional of me and then 
Um, a friend of mine who has been trans for a long while and is male to female, she just, um, she's been going through hormones for a very long time and pretty strictly in the, the feminine realm now, but, um, she's trying to get into social work because of her own understanding of her recent discovery of her own neurodiversity. And she has been told that she was unprofessional because of behaviors and experiences she's dealing with in school that are inherent neurodivergent traits and behaviors. And this place doesn't understand those. And instead of understanding her is ruling her out for being unprofessional and putting reprimands on her. Sorry to hear all that. I'm really sorry to hear all that. I'm sorry you're going through that and that your friend is going through that. And like, just to just first just validate like how how awful this 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 is. Um, you know, I I I I I'd also say how not um not uncommon this is. Um uh, Sierra. You're still yeah. muted. Oh, no, thank you. you. I was getting to the button. Um, <laughs> hang, hang on. I, I, uh, I, uh, oh, sorry. You're both Sierra. I'm so sorry. All right. So Sierra Miller, go for it. Who was going to respond to uh, other Sierra's uh, <laughs> comment? That's funny. Perfect timing. Um, yeah, I just really, I, I, I think that really resonates with me. I think the, um, the idea of professionalism, I, um, as a first generation college student, I was very lucky to be in a program in college that like taught us professionalism and we did etiquette classes and professional dress classes. And, you know, it was great because we were able to like get those things that we wouldn't otherwise have, but being in a group of mostly other neurodivergent college kids and it was so much more comforting being in a group of people who were like, yeah, we have no idea why this clothing is considered professional and this one isn't, or why I can't have blue hair in a professional setting, um, but you I can't have brown hair. the overload issues with clothing. Sorry, I just had to put that in there. No, exactly. It really, it really is. Um, and I think it, it was, it was surprisingly how much more comforting it was being in a group of other people who were like, yeah, this is ridiculous. And I think that, that like co-regulation and that being able to voice in a workplace or whatever, like, hey, we know these rules are ridiculous, just like take so much of that pressure off, even if you still have to, whatever, do that dress or change your hairstyle or whatever that looks like. Right. And I think that there is something about um, the character judgment that comes from being told you're unprofessional. Um, like there, it, it as as though you know, it's one thing to say. You know, recently, recently, I had to, I, I gave some advice um, around um, a dress code situation that came up, um, and uh, you know, um, anyway, uh, uh, we don't, we don't have a dress code at All Brains Belong, and like a lot of the other like stuff that's in like a neuronormative employee handbook, like we don't have those things here. But anyway, I had to give advice to the outside world about dress code. And it became, you know, I think framing this around conflicting access needs is really important. So if you have, um, if you're serving, if like depending on what type of job you have, but if like you have some sort of like client facing work and your, your client has an access need for like, you know, feeling secure or like, you know, they have like, you know, cultural assumptions, their brain rules, not world rules, but like they're still their brain rules. Um, so like, you know, your workplace may need to figure out how to negotiate that where it's not your own professional. It's we have to cue safety to a, a client base for X, Y reason. That doesn't mean that you're unprofessional. It means that um, how do we cue safety to this client base and how do we get you what you need? Also, how do we negotiate that? Laura. I put my hand down because you went exactly where I was going to ask you, Mel. I, as a nursing instructor, we're constantly being challenged by our students to look again at our professionalism definition for really good reason. But we're always trying to balance that with what patients expect to see in a nurse and cueing safety to our patients. And I think that push and pull you just addressed so beautifully 
like, I'm like, how do I, I need to write that down and bring that to our department to say like, this is how we need to present this issue and, and expand our definition of professionalism to be more inclusive. Right. And so that your students know that there's nothing unprofessional about having blue hair or having a tattoo. It's really about some brains, they have th some nervous systems have this limbic response to blue hair or a tattoo or whatever. That doesn't mean that yours is wrong or unprofessional. It's just that like same way that like when uh when I um when I interact with my in-laws, um from rural North Carolina, I speak a lot more slowly than I do when I'm around my New Yorker parents, like, because talking quickly does not cue safety. And like, kind of like at the beginning of Brain Club, where we talk about like cueing safety comes first. And so, you know, it's not because I'm going to try to infringe upon your access needs to have blue hair, um, just to follow that example. Um, but it's really just about like, it's it's all of our collective responsibility to cue safety to one another. What is that going to look like? And a component of that is going to, bye Monique, um, a component of that is also going to be, you know, providing some education to the people who, about their brain rules, right? So it's, 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 it's all of the above. And I think that like when you try to address just a component of that it, it it doesn't work same way that like i have to go give feedback to my six-year-old we got some feedback that um uh that um they've been i think they've just been verbally stimming like vocally stimming in school um when i go give feedback now it's not going to be like don't do that that's wrong it's going to be like it's going to be in the context of conflicting access needs of like hey what do you need okay, how else can we meet that? Okay, so there might be some brains that have conflicting access needs here where they need quiet in order to, like the teacher needs quiet in order to talk and think and stuff. So how do you get what you need um, without infringing upon the access needs of others? That's all. Um, and I think that the same goes in the workplace. I love that. Yeah, with um, my specific um, example was, I guess for me, my psycholo psychological safety was being um, kind of stepped on by this uh, colleague and also service provider, because I'm, I'm in that weird brackish waters of um, peer support coordinator. So I am both coordinator and client for this company. It's a weird spot to be in. But anyway, um, she was staring at me like, and I'm like, lady, what's going on? Like, is there something on my face? It's like, no, this is just my face. I'm like, okay, I don't know what's going on. I'm having a really intense reaction in, in interest, anxiety reaction. And I am a neurodivergent empath and autistic. And I am, I'm really picking up on some vibes. I can't focus on what we're doing until we clear the air. I just needed to say something about it. I didn't expect anything from her. I just, I needed, um, an idea of what was going on or what was contributing to that expression and what was, what was it, what it meant, meant you know, whether it meant anything or nothing. Right. It's about, it's no. about clarity <laughs> as an access need. So I think again, bringing, br bringing, bringing this around, around access needs, I think, I think is the way forward. Jay. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. I, I'm really enjoying this discussion about what access needs are and conflicting access needs, but I also want to bring up the idea, which is something, unfortunately, I'm bringing my work in here because I work in a diversity, equity, and justice kind of focused field. Um, but one thing that we talk about sometimes is the difference between, and I'm I'm bringing this in to talk about like the difference between letting your interpersonal bias, because what I, uh, let me start over. What I'm concerned about is that someone with biases that they haven't unpacked yet meaning like they haven't thought about why they have those feelings or biases could use that as a, an excuse to, well, to say like, well, I need to, I need a white doctor instead of a black doctor, because that's an access need that I have because I'm uncomfortable around uh, having a black doctor take care of me. And like, there have been cases of, of people showing up in emergency rooms and saying, I won't, I won't be seen by a, you know, a, a black doctor instead of a white doctor. So, um, so I would encourage people to think about, um, is this an access need based on my neurodiversity? Is this a product of some kind of trained implicit bias that I have as a result of 
how I grew up or how experience or, you know, messages that I've got from the media about who fits the mold of like, a what does a doctor look like? Uh, or, you know, what is a whatever. So I'm, I'm a little at the end of my, <laughs> I, I'm just, um, don't, it's like a yes and it's like, yes, I love this whole dialogue that's going around uh, on around that access needs. And let's not let our internal biases turn into access needs. Does that make sense? Like, Amen. some people might say like, oh, well, I can't use they, them pronouns for people because I can't adjust my language that way. And it's like, well, is that really an access no. need for you not to use my pronouns or is that- That's like, not an access need. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 And so Jay, I think in the way I would like wrap this all up and, and, and as I wrap us up tonight, I think it's like when we talk about conflicting access needs, we that we do that within neuro inclusive space or within inclusive space. So we have that's why like we I don't I hope this is effective, but like we start brain club with a community agreement. And so like if we, we are going to assume we're, we're going to have conflicting access needs here, even within this space, because we all have different brains. So therefore we all have different access needs. So we're going to have to negotiate that. But like, we are all we're operating from within a community agreement that is, we are trying to cue safety and signal inclusion um, for all people. Like that is the premise and so any, I think to your point, Jay, like if someone is coming at this and being like, I have an access need for like something that's exclusive and harmful, um, like that's not, that's not, you didn't meet the first step, which was that we have a community agreement to be an inclusive community together. And so with that, I think um, it's a perfect transition to not next week, but the following week, um, we'll be joined by our community panel. Um, we've got, um, uh, four community organizations, um, representatives coming to talk about um, their vision for inclusion. And I think it'll be a, a great conversation. So thanks everyone. Um, and and again, uh, Lizzie, Lizzie put in the chat, Lizzie, can you do it one more time? The link to November Brain Club registration. So if you registered for any of the October Brain Clubs, you will get that by email. Um, but uh, after that, you it's the same link. Like if you keep your link, it's fine. Like just keep using the same Zoom link. Um, but if you do want the recording sent to you, if you can't make it live, uh, we do recommend registering. And it's, um, you know, it's... Anyway, all that. Thanks, everybody. Have a good two weeks.